welcome to her inside stepping outside so i'm going to ask you all to put your view on speaker view and let you know there will be a q a at the end so feel free to put forward your questions and comments in the chat as we go along this performance brings together some wonderful writings from contemporary women and women from a bygone area which form part of the blog first inside created by susan croft of unfinished histories tonight we have a cast of professional and community performers to read them for you some of you may have attended our online event last year women in the lockdown or even in person as part of love and survival in time of covid where we shared texts about the joys of confinement, social isolation and lockdown. This year, we focus on to stepping back outside tentatively, boldly, angrily, what it might look like now are dreams and desires. Her insight has always included earlier historical texts that resonated with the experiences of lockdown uncertainty and now the dilemmas of trying to move forward through sharing their and our experiences and to stepping outside imaginatively and actually first we hear a new piece by beth Kay's love song to theater something many of us missed acutely Backstage, before the show, nerves stretch the air. Actors follow their routines to readiness. And then the hiatus as the lights go black and the show takes its first breath. In the foyer, clean clothes, brushed hair, ticket in hand, eyeing up the other audience members, excited. The bell rings and into the dark, torched ushers, seated. The house lights dim to black and we sink back into our chairs, waiting. I miss you, theater. COVID has shut your doors and blocked your entrances and exits. The ghosts are all that prance and thrill and sweat upon your stage now. My heart is sunk, sinking. My body is pricked, pricking. The city is dull. The voices of imagination cannot be heard as their home is barred. Netflix, neon, Disney, you say. But this is not theater. No breath and spit and crackling energy. No actors in real time, body and soul, working their butts off, creating that magic that is only theater. I miss you, theater. It's easy to forget where we've come out from. Long COVID, brain fog, Groundhog Day. When in March 2021, Her Inside did a performance online, it looked like things might soon begin to reopen. When in August last year, Susan wrote the outline for a new phase of Her Inside stepping outside, it focused on tentatively trying to get back to normal. But then the variants came along and we were in and out like the proverbial hokey-cokey. Now, most of us are beginning to move more sure-footedly into this strange new world. Though, with current events, many of us now may be wondering what on earth this world is going to become. And wondering when we can put strongman politics behind us. Over the half-finished houses, night comes. The builders stand on the roof. It is quiet after the hammers. The pulleys hang slack. Giants, the roof walkers, on a listing deck, the wave of darkness about to break on their heads. The sky is a torn sail where figures pass magnified shadows on a burning deck. I feel like them up there, exposed, larger than life, and due to break my neck. Was it worthwhile to lay, with infinite exertion, a roof I can't live under, all those 
blueprints, closing of gaps, measurings, calculations. A life I didn't choose chose me. Even my tools are the wrong ones for what I have to do. I am naked, ignorant, a naked man fleeing across the roofs who could, with a shade of indifference, be sitting in the lamplight against the cream wallpaper reading, not with indifference, about a naked man fleeing across the roofs. During the pandemic, Florence Nightingale's name was given to London's emergency temporary hospital. Florence Nightingale herself fought passionately for the freedom trapped within a traditional feminine role that consigned women to domestic interiors, calmness and conventional roles. Nightingale was 32 when she wrote Cassandra as part of a longer work. And it wasn't until 1928, 76 years later, that Ray Strachey included it in her book, The Cause, a short history of the women's movement in Britain. Why have women, passion, intellect, moral activity, these three, and a place in society where no one of the three can be exercised? One often comes to be thus wandering alone in the bitterness of life without. In the conventional society, which men have made for women and women have accepted, they must have no passions, they must act the farce of hypocrisy, the lie that they are without passion, and therefore what else can they say to their daughters without giving the lie to themselves? Suffering, sad, female humanity. Fathers, mothers, you who see your daughter proudly rejecting all semblance of flirtation, primly engaged in the duties of the breakfast table, you little think how her fancy compensates itself by endless interviews and sympathies with the fancy's companion of the hour. And you say, she is not susceptible. Women have no passion. Mothers, who cradle yourselves in visions about the domestic hearth, how many of your sons and daughters are there, do you think, while sitting around under your complacent eye? Were you there yourself during your own now forgotten girlhood? What are the thoughts of these young girls while one is singing Schubert, another is reading the review, and a third is busy embroidering? Is not one fancying herself the nurse of some new friend in sickness, another engaging in romantic dangers with him, such as call out the character and afford more food for sympathy than the monotonous events of domestic society? Another, undergoing unheard of trials, under the observation of someone whom she has chosen as the companion of her dream. It is the want of interest in our life which produces it. Filling, by filling up that want of interest in our life, we alone can remedy it. Give us back our suffering. We cry to heaven in our hearts, suffering rather than indifferentism. For out of nothing comes nothing. But out of suffering, may come the cure. Better have pain than paralysis. A hundred struggle and drown in the breakers. One discovers the new world, but rather, ten times rather, die in the self, surf, heralding the way to that new world than stand idly on the shore. Passion, intellect, moral activity, these three have never been satisfied in a woman. In this cold and oppressive conventional atmosphere, they cannot be satisfied. To say more on this subject would be to enter into the whole history of society of the present state of civilization. Women are never supposed to have any occupation of sufficient importance not to be interrupted, except suckling their fools. And women have accepted this, have written books to support it, and have trained and trained themselves to consider whatever they do as not of such value to the world or to others, but that they can throw it up at the first claim of social life. They have accustomed themselves to consider intellectual occupation as a merely selfish amusement, which it is their duty to give up for every trifler more selfish than themselves. Women have no means given them whereby they can resist the claims of social life. 
They are taught from their infancy upwards that it is wrong, ill-tempered, and a misunderstanding of woman's mission with a great M, if they do not allow themselves willingly to be interrupted at all hours. If a woman has wants to put in a claim to be treated as a man by some work of science or art or literature, which show as the fruit of her leisure, then she will be considered justified in having leisure. Hardly, perhaps, even then. But if not, if she has nothing to show, she must resign herself to her fate. Closer to home, we stepped outside into our local streets or maybe moved to new locations where our presence was sometimes seen as a problem or negotiated new relationships with neighbours and neighbourhoods. We'll now have three short poems, the first by Fiona Bennett and two by Nettie Scriven from her five poems in lockdown, followed by a short play called Catastrophizing. And you might recognise me in there. I'll be the one knitting. The bay window is the prow of a ship. Her armchair, the captain's bridge, as she travels the long hours in stillness and silence. In winter, the rose bush in her small front garden is pruned out of sight, exposing school gates opposite, shoppers heading to town, mothers with prams, and me on my way to the post office. There is always a moment as I pass, my head busy with lists, when I am shamed a little as I flash my quick smile and the curve of the window superimposes my reflection over her resolute stare, blanking me through the glass. Yet I continue my ritual display until one day the chair is vacant and the mirror on the wall catches my startled face. We stayed in the quiet haven of my birthplace and childhood, a split second decision to be near my frail mother. Don't leave me, she whispered. In the village we stayed, helicopters above searching out people gathering, the morning walk for fresh eggs and bread, curtains twitching at neighbor's fingertips. I'm here for a while, I reassured, a moment's decision to stay a lifetime searching for home, staying, feet sinking into sand, hair wet with salty spit, fucking go back home, the neighbour swore. Poem two. Dog at water's edge, nudging the seaweed, foraging for crabs. Dog lying at my side, although preferring not to. Father, far rather explored the ebb and flow of tide. Woman, a neighbour, hovering at hand, bronzed, shuffling this way and that along the road, head lowered, eyes somewhere but not here, roads separating the village from the foreshore. Busy normally, and some traffic now, but she crosses repeatedly walking through the fields. Some gravity pulling her. Water, road, field, house, back and forth, back and forth. Later, my mother and I sit in the garden. I am masked against her frailty, separated by distance. Not just the present imposition, but years of anger wrapped around a kernel of love. A silent pendulum between fury and love. I plant pansies a reminder of my grandmother long ago, the velvet touch a balm to the rage bouncing off my mother and circling around her. 
My mother replete on the words of desperation at living this half life of no sight and fractured memories. She rises half falling back to her place inside, her home, her harbour, and falls deeply asleep, spent. All will be forgotten on waking, but not forgiven. I water the plants, cooling the heat, still trapped within the air, medically wiping all the traces left of myself away and leave. My rapid heartbeat only falling to a steady rhythm after walking a repeated line along the pounding seashore. A neighbour again, twitching at the window, watches. First the walk with the dog early morning and then later the trip in the car. He makes a note, scrawling left to right across the page. A phone call tonight to his friends in the police. Much later, the sky luminous with stars, no cloud for cover. The last train heard rumbling its steady vigil along the foreshore. The dog and I trot outside for her last pee of the night. We avoid the weed killer, just newly laid at the grassy edge, thank you dear neighbour, and walk quietly along the road. Day is complete, and the night moves on in its silent way, in its waiting, watching wake. Mrs. White, it's Sarah from number four. Mrs. White, I know you're in there. I can see a light through the crack in the curtains. Please, just answer the door, Mrs. White. You can talk to me. You know you can. We've been neighbours for six years. We always have a good chat, don't we? About the day the bins are collected, the weather, and um, which bin to put out? Mrs. White, the others are going to keep coming back until you answer the door. They're talking about calling the police. You don't want that now, do you? Mrs. White, I think it would help if you talk to me. You see, I'm less angry than the others. I want to understand, to help you. Have a think on it and I'll pop back in a bit. Perhaps we can talk then. They've accused me of stealing. Me stealing the bloody cheek of it. I've never stolen a thing in my life. Not even a penny sweet at the corner store. Nothing, never. Borrowing is different from stealing. I know, because I looked it up in the Oxford Dictionary. It states, that stealing is to take something from a person or store without permission and without intending to return it. But you see, I do intend to return it. So by the definition, it's not stealing. It says it here in black and white. I looked up stealing on the internet. Oh, you'd be amazed what has been stolen though. I mean, a lorry carrying 11,000 pounds of Nutella was stolen. Imagine this, that's about 6,875 jars of the stuff. <laughs> then there was the time that a group of men dressed as engineers dismantled a bridge in broad daylight in the Czech Republic. <laughs> they just took it apart, packed it in a van and drove it away, just like that. A whole bridge gone. Imagine crossing the bridge to work one morning and then not being able to get home because the bridge has gone. <laughs> Beggars Billy, imagine that. No, I wouldn't describe what I'm doing as theft. I'm just making use of something that would go to waste. I'm like one of those tiny people, the ones in the book, the borrowers. Now, what was the name of that author? Oh yes, Mary Norton, that's it. Mrs. White, I've just spoken to the other neighbours and they've all said, until you speak to me, they won't call the police. 
Mrs. White. I've made them understand that this is a very strange situation and you need someone to talk to. I can acknowledge how overwhelmed you must be feeling. You see, work put me on a two-week counseling and well-being course. It gave me skills that the other neighbors don't have. Charlotte, I think we need to reframe the situation and stop catastrophizing. We just need to find a point of stability and restore the equilibrium. I've brought some cake so we can sit and have a nice cup of tea. If you don't like lemon drizzle, I can get something else. I like coconut cake. Perfect, Charlotte. I can hear that you're beginning to speak your truth. I'll go and get coconut cake right now, and then we can have that chat. Okay then, I'll be back in a jiffy with some coconut cake. I ate all cake. I prefer cheese and biscuits with a good tomato relish, but anything to get rid of her. I mean, catastrophizing, that is so hilarious. How did she say that with a straight face? <laughs> I can't believe it. I haven't passed the time of day with any of the neighbours that keep banging on my door. Well, other than the one who came here. She's got a saviour complex, that one. But she's as bad as the others. I've heard her talking about me like I'm batshit crazy. It's not hard to get them into the house, a tin of tuna or some treats, and they're in like a shot. I've devised a colour-coded system so that I know which cat has which bowl. I need it because I've had up to 11 cats in here at any one time. I've coaxed them into my house for years and it's gone largely unnoticed. Of course, now because of COVID-19, it's been more difficult. Some clever dick at number 11 has even started a community page on Facebook. Don't get me wrong, I love Facebook because I can stay in touch with my niece in New Zealand, but this community page has made it more difficult. Ooh, I don't know how they knew it was me, but now I've got people hammering on my door day and night. I can hear them talking. They say, eh, she must be so bored and lonely, or she's not in her right mind. The usual stuff people say about old people. Idiots. I couldn't care less what they think. I'm running a business here. I've got a lady in Holland waiting for an order. This is Alex. This is my favorite. <laughs> He lives over the road with a woman and her daughter. He's got the silkiest, most luxurious fur. And it's wonderful for making yarn. Rain is expected at midnight in Auckland. It was a shock, the mid-November sun after weeks of lockdown, lockdown rain. I had to count the hairs on my, my legs as they screamed, let me out to my jeans. Even the sag stretched bit of skin in my armpit, inside arm said, I don't care if people see me, it's boiling. So sli I slipped on my sleeveless dress and sandals, but rain is expected at midnight. It will surround my house shell, lockdown cave, hold me in introvert's excuses. The sun can turn me out another day. The blog Her Inside has also brought together many pieces from the USA, Brazil, Australia, and New Zealand, like the one we just heard from Beth Case. Pieces from abroad remind us how connected we are. 
not only through the global nature of the pandemic, but also the climate crisis. They remind us how the words her inside connect to larger issues of confinement and locking down for our own good and resonate with the experience of exile and displacement and possible return. Stepping outside may also be a stepping outside our comfort zones into connectedness, confrontation with authority and activism. Sleep for days when, in her deepest sleep, Madame Talet returns to Chagos was launched in. I confess, I gave in to despair and didn't sleep for days when, in her deepest sleep, Madame Talet returns to Chagos was launched in New York's Schoenberg Center, where artists and activists pass on the battle, where Amira Baraka's hand asked Mayor Angela's hand for a dance cheek to cheek. When Harry Belafonte met Ella Fitzgerald for a timeless duet. I'm hiding at my parents' house in New Barnet. My iconic amulet, Toni Morrison, flashes on screen. My carefree world interrupted by fear of self-promotion. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, the nervous system out of sync. Sounds like root shock. This shifting mindscape was once sacred, where I whispered, territories. Who has the right to name us and our ancestral homelands? The Queen, the UN, the US, the UK, the Mauritian government. Who are they to refuse the Shigossians' prayers to return to the archipelago? Dear God, no man, woman or child shall be exiled from their islands. I can <clears throat> Her Inside has attracted visual artwork and music as well as written pieces. Artist Carmen Liberti and Beatrice Acevedo, as a way of escaping from the confinement and isolation of lockdown, began to work in the tactile medium of clay creating a cabinet of lockdown curiosities. What to do when all your normal spaces are confined, your freedom is restricted and fear invades all our lives. The COVID crisis pushed us to have a reckoning of what we took for granted in terms of mobility, but also in the way which we are living our lives. As women artists, we were specifically affected as the already limited spaces for art became even more restricted. We decided to work with a completely different medium to our traditional practice, and we embraced the possibilities of clay. We aimed at reclaiming, touching through the work with the clay, staging a protest against the so-called dangerous aspects of touching others. We talked about these and many other issues during the lockdown, and we both developed our own ideas and work with clay. Carmen Lamberti worked with the concept of wabi-sabi, a traditional Japanese worldview centered on accepting and embracing the imperfections of life. Wabi Wabi Sabi through Carmen embraces the Wabi Sabi through the fragility and the vulnerability of the handmade, using clay as a means of slowing down and to find solid ground during times of adversity. Sculpting each piece becomes a metaphor for restoration and healing, underlying the importance of acceptance and appreciation of simple things. Beatrice Achevedo took a different route. Inspired by the resilience, versatility and magic of mushrooms, she developed a series of lichen, those wonderful hybrid creatures made of fungi and algae. 
Beatrice was inspired by the book, The Mushroom at the End of the World, on the possibility of life in capitalistic ruins by Anna Lohan Hap Sin, an anthropologist who tracks back the appearance of the Mutsutake mushrooms in landscapes that have been ecologically degraded. Fungi and lichens teach us so much about resilience, adaptation, collaboration, and regeneration. Hence Beatrice's collection of augmented lichens aim at inspiring. Inspiring audiences to think about what we can learn from these very evolved organisms, organisms crucial for life on the planet. We also picked the idea of displaying our work in a Wunderkammer, or cabinet of wonder. A cabinet of curiosities works as an ambulatory museum in small spaces and provides mobility unlike museums and galleries that were closed during the crisis. We like the idea of having our own little museum, our place to relax, to wonder, to feel awe and calm in these turbulent times. Women artists and writers have always created spaces of resistance, even if it's just been in giving voice to the pain of their exclusion from the world they wanted to enter. Susan the Indispensable is a little known play from the 1890s by suffragette Evelyn Sharp. She came from that generation who struggled for the right to pursue an education and a career as writers or artists. For some of us, that struggle continues. Susan is 43 and has given up the past 20 years to taking care of her stepbrothers and sisters and her querulous and ineffectual stepmother. Now, the older stepsister, Prue, is getting engaged to Bobby and moving to London. Darling, I want you to come to London and be my chaperone. <laughs> Go and tidy your hair, child, and don't talk nonsense. But I mean it, Sook. I want you to get away from here and do things, big things. Think of your magnificent talent. Talent? Do things? What are you saying? Do try to think of yourself. Do try to think of yourself for five minutes if you can. If you don't break away now, you never will. Think what it means to go on living here, where you can't paint pictures. Pictures? How dare you talk to me of pictures? I never allow anyone to say that such a thing to me. Come on. You can be as angry as you like, but do say you will come away, Sook. Come away. It's your last chance. You won't have the spirit to do it if you leave it any longer. Prue. Prue? Talking like this? No, it isn't Prue. It's, it's the modern spirit. Susan, where are you? May we have tea in the garden? It will be too late. Too late if you don't get away now. Susan, wherever are you? Well, well, can we have tea in the garden? It is too late now. I've left it, as you say, till I haven't the spirit to do it. Yes, yes, if Elizabeth doesn't... Yeah, yes, yes, if Elizabeth doesn't mind. But not the best cups, mind. Do you think I don't know? Do you think it has been easy all these years? When Brian went away, I thought I couldn't suffer more than I did then. But I found I could. After he went, I don't know how it was. Perhaps if he hadn't been the only man we ever saw, I should never have... Anyhow, when he went, I found that time could cure that sort of pain pretty easily. Yes, I guess that, yes. But there was the other thing. Time couldn't stop my minding about that. You mean wanting to paint? It was like a big pain that I carried about with me. I tried to go through the day without looking at things for fear I should see pictures in them. Sometimes I succeeded for weeks together. You were all young and I had to slave incessantly in the house. 
then it would come on me like an obsession. I saw pictures everywhere, everywhere. Wherever I looked, I saw pictures. And I couldn't paint them because I'm a woman, because I wasn't a man. But surely you had some time. Were we such absorbing little beasts as all that? Some time, some time. I'm not talking of an amusement child. I'm talking of something that is I, the whole of me, when I'm possessed by it. Do you suppose it could be satisfied in 10 minutes now and then? 10 minutes that is sure to be interrupted the whole time. Hey, where's Susan? Elizabeth's in a howling fury about tea. Susan, where are you? Oh, I know it is only men who are supposed to feel like this about their work, and men tell us that no woman has ever been a Michelangelo. Souk, do you ever feel like that now? It doesn't come so often. I've nearly killed it. Don't. Oh, don't. I've killed something else too. The desire to alter things. There was a time when I could have been a flaming rebel, when I wanted to let loose fire and sword in the land for the sake of making it better for the other women. But all that is dead now. I see the other world of the men and women that will come after. But I can only look on. I can't help. I can't be one of them. You can, Suk. You can. Come away with me. When you've had to crush the thing in your heart that mattered most, all the other things die with it. That is what has been happening to women, I suppose, for hundreds of years. But always, always, there were some women who were not crushed by it. They went on. They're still going on, making it better for the men and women that come after. Yes. You were one of those, child. I belong to the women whose spirit has been killed by it. I shall stay here now till the rest of me dies too. I shall grow a little older, a little more patient every day. The children I have brought up will go away and lead their own lives. And some of them will forget me. For a little while, there will be a mother. And she will grow a little older, a little more exacting every day. And when she is gone, there will be hardly any money to live upon. And I shall live upon it with care and economy. People will be kind and they'll ask me out to tea when they are alone. And they will tell one another after I've gone that it is a pity I did not marry and have children of my own. Oh, it will be very calm and very peaceful and quite colourless. It will be what hundreds of middle class women have endured for generations. <laughs> I can't bear it. I can't bear it. <laughs> My poo, you're crying. There's nothing to cry about. I ought not to have talked about myself. I never do usually. This is just... I don't know. What's the use of calling me the modern spirit? What's the use of being engaged to an Oxford blue? What's the use of anything if I can't help a magnificent person like you? <laughs> there, there. Don't be tragic about it. You're going to be the future. And that's much better than crying over the past. Look. Bobby's hunting for you among the rose beds. She's here, Bobby. She's coming. <laughs> Don't let him see your unhappy child. Why not? He'll have to see me unhappy. Someday, he'd better get used to it now. Bobby, where are you? I want you, Bobs. I want you. My dear, I've been looking for you everywhere. The children have been upsetting Elizabeth over the tea and I can't find my paisley shawl. Oh, I'm sorry, Mother. I was talking to Prue. Oh, Prue. Where is the dear child? Washing her face, it is hoped. Shall we go into the garden? Oh, you're so unromantic, Susan. The beautiful side of life never seems to appeal to you at all. You'll want your air cushion, won't you? 
I often wonder why Brian never proposed to you. Such a, a good looking girl as you were in those days. Such an excellent housekeeper. Here it is. According to you, brother, I seem to have come, been a cross between a court beauty and a good plain cook with excellent references. Oh, well, you think I'm a foolish, sentimental old mother. Well, so I am. Always putting my children's happiness before everything. Are you ready, mother? Talking of romance, what have you done with the Moody book? Such a dull one this week. No love in it at all. I thought it rather good. It's up in my room. Then fetch it at once. I, I don't like the books left. Yes, Mother. You have the paisley shawl? Yes, Mother. And the air cushion? Yes, Mother. Yes, everything. Well, dear, it's no use being impatient. You know, you do forget things sometimes. Yes, I do, fortunately. What did you say, Susan? Uh, oh, nothing, Mother. As you say, it's no use being impatient. It's no use being impatient. City streets remain an area of exclusion for women in many parts of the world. Here too, they can still be an area of risk and danger, but also freedom and excitement. Spaces we've always had to claim and reclaim. Tomorrow writes falsely in the tea leaves, a faulty map made of patched up bits in fits and starts and nobody tells me it's not just a turn of phrase. To travel lightly in neon, I am told where to get the kicks, when to take the shots, how to plug the holes and walk dark streets in a liquid force field, light as air. On Stroud Green Road, I I'm told I am lovely and may all your dreams come true, darling. Yes, well, there never was a right reason to be sad, but don't you feel better now, darling? Hating how the cynicism paints it all so sinister, writes it all so wrong. Still the memory sticks like the little bits of redness in my geographic tongue. Tomorrow sends messages in which my name does not appear. But the city has skin and it feels me through. It feels me though. I feel strange to be here and yet stay here and feel strange to stay here and yet here and here. Another prominent suffrage campaigner, Margaret Wynne Nevinson, became a poor law guardian and workhouse visitor in the 1900s and appears to have created verbatim accounts of the words of the women she then met confined there, publishing them in a newspaper column in the press and in 19 gathering them as a collection called Workhouse Characters. Oh no, ma'am. I ain't ever had no misfortune. I'm a respectable girl, I am. Why am I in the workhouse then? Well, you see, it's like this. I had a very wicked temper and I can't control it somehow. And when the mistresses are aggravating and I run from my place, I always do run away. I, I mean, there's nothing against the last mistress. It was just my nasty temper. Then I got wandering about the streets and a policeman spoke to me and took me to a kind lady and she put me here to prove me and left me to learn my lesson. She takes a great interest in my case. Oh yeah, Matron says it's a disgrace for a strong girl to be on the rates, but what am I to do? 
I ain't got no clothes, no character. So I suppose I shall always be here now. No, it ain't nice. We never go out, nor see nothing. Leastways, the young women don't. There's no sweet puddings and no jam. Some of the girls say jail's far better. Yeah, yeah, I am an orphan. At least father died when I was very little and the board gentleman put me and my brothers into the schools. No, I ain't heard of them. No more. Mother came to see me at first, but she ain't been nor wrote for five years. Perhaps she's dead or married again. No, no I don't know how old I am. Machen says she expects about 18. Uh, oh, yeah, I've been in places. I mean, the board ladies got me my first place at a butcher's, only he was always coming after me, trying to kiss me. And the missus, oh, she did not seem to like it somehow. And she cut me up nasty and there was words and I went off in a temper. No, gentlemen, no, I should think not. The damn low scoundrel, I call him. I beg your pardon, man. You know, I know damned isn't a word for ladies. I ain't no ignorant girl but there's worse that's said in the young women's room sometimes. Then this time some nuns took me to their home and there I made a great mistake. I thought it was a Church of England home, but they were Catholics. Oh yeah, the nuns were very kind to me, real good ladies. But you know, the lady that takes an interest in my case, she said I had made a great mistake. And I don't know why, except that I was always a Church of England girl. Oh, no, ma'am, I hope they, I may never make a worse mistake for they was good. And they sang beautiful in the chapel. Then the nuns found me a place with these two old homespun people, but they was very dull and often ill. And I was always getting muddled over the spoons and the forks and that made them irritable. And then one day I felt so low spirited and nasty tempered and then I ran away again. I mean, the worst place for me is no porters sit on the front doors and I run away before I think, and then I get no character. But this time I've been proved and, and I've learned my lesson. Oh no, I won't do it anymore. No, ma'am, no. And I never knew I could be taken to the police courts just for running away. None of the ladies never told me. I thought you could only be copped for murders and stealing. Daisy White, she that stole her Mrs. Silk Petticoat to go out on a Sunday, she's now out of jail and no one won't have her no more. But it's mostly misfortunes that bring girls in here, and fits of course. Blanche, that girl with a big squint eye, yeah, she went on a fit yesterday when we were scrubbing the wards. No, I don't have no fits. I'm honest as the day. Would I be a good girl and not run away if you get me a place? Oh, ma'am, only try me. The kind ladies quote me Texases, but they never get me a job. No, I don't mind missing dinner. It's, it's, it's only suet pudding today with very little sugar. In situations, they give you beautiful sweet puddings nearly every day. And Juliet Brown, she that's in with her third misfortune, she says she's lived with lords and ladies near the palace at Buckingham. Well, at least she pretends she has. She says in her places, the servants had jam with their tea every day. Ah, oh, it's beautiful to see the sun shining and the shops and the horses. Oh, and the ladies walking about with the dear little children. Oh, I love children. Often when the labour mistresses was out, I'd run up to the nursery and kiss the babies. I haven't been out of doors in three months. And the young women may not go out of the workhouse, only the old people. So you can guess I like it. But the air, it makes me hungry. We had our gruel at seven this morning and we don't have no tea or breakfast, but girls in situations do, I know. And as much sugar as they like, at least in most places. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I should, I, should love a, I should love a bun. I love cakes. <laughs> uh, I have a cold in my head. And I ain't got no pocket handkerchief. I lost it. And it wasn't very grand. Old bit of old rag, I call it. Oh, it'd be very kind of you if you were to buy me one, ma'am. I know it looks bad to go and see ladies without one. I ain't no ignorant girl. The kind lady who takes an interest in my case always said that. Oh, isn't that barrel organ music beautiful? That makes me want to dance. Only I don't know how. Daisy White, she that pinched the silk petticoat, she can dance beautiful. Some of us sing tunes in the young women's room and she dance. I love music. That's why I like the Catholic house the best. The nans, they sang lovely in the chapel. 
Oh, is this the house? Oh, ain't it lovely? I ain't never seen such a beautiful drawing room in all my life. Oh, just look at that carpet and the flowers and the pictures. Oh, ain't that beautiful, Mum? With the trees and the water running down the rocks and the old castle at the back. And the nuns at the Catholic home once took us on an excursion by train to a place just like that. And whilst we were having our tea, the old castle suddenly turned yellow in the sun. And it was like Jerusalem the Golden. Do you think they will have me, Mum? I shan't never want to run away from here. I'll be a good girl, Mum. I promise. I promise I'll be good. Spring 2022, on the threshold, early blossom outside my window, COVID turning tail, <laughs> listen to my voice, oh no, today I step back and I'm raging and I'm writing. When I heard a maternity hospital had been bombed in Mariupol today, International Women's Day, March the 8th of all days, Every cell in my body is revolting. Enough is enough is enough. These times demand news stories, lived stories of ordinary yet remarkable human revolutions, real stories written for ourselves and our children's children's children. And how to tell my story now, Susan? My walk with Camino to COP26 last year, 500 miles to the United Nations Conference of the Parties in Glasgow, was a beautiful thing to do. And as I say this, I appreciate the crazy juxtaposition of my choice and others' non-choice to walk with an escalation of displaced peoples fleeing on foot across our globe due to climate injustice and rampant military abuse. But I must not undermine the beauty and audacious privilege of this simple act of striding out in the face of despair. Indeed, the seeds of grateful rebellion are wedged deep, sprouting anew. 
My husband has Parkinson's, a neurological disease that causes him to physically freeze. Um, these last two years, his full-time carer, we'd been locked in together with COVID until with the wondrous support of our daughters and to his relief and mine, I was able to strike out to walk the talk. So autumn 2021, stepping out. Good morning world. I believe in the power of community, woman, artist, mother, grandmother, friend, daughter, Buddhist, neighbor, crone, sister, wife. I am a sovereign village unto myself, as are we all. And I'm ready. I'm infused with a sense of mission. I make a symbolic decision to start my walk to COP26, departing from the town where I was born, red bricked Burslem, and prepare to join fellow Kamenistas in the rural city of Leek. Crossing a drawbridge, I step onto the Mersey Trent Canal towpath on a sunny day in September, carrying a staff of fluttering red, blue, yellow ribbons. On the ribbons, written in indelible ink, the names, hopes and prayers of loved ones. I start walking, 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 talking strangers and their stories adding to my ribbons walking thinking deciding to become creator of what i can be break free from what i have become in recent years and this is not easy every morning i bow in gratitude to life crazy as it sounds this helps thank you i say because even if doubt spits back into my mouth, what I need to do right now is spit it right back out, turn poison into medicine and deal with the ominous blisters appearing on my right heel, dangerously filling up brain space with pain. It occurs to me there's no time to stop, no time to heal. Walk, walk, walk. Camino means path, the way. Camino to COP26, Extinction Rebellion, Faith Bridge. And this is our Camino statement of intent. And I want to read it because I'm really proud of it. And because it helps you understand what bound us as one. We are united by our faith. A faith that we can advocate and influence and be the change that we want for our world. We choose to walk to COP26 as a practice of that faith, an act of connection with the earth on which we walk and the communities through which we pass. And we make our way in kinship with the peoples and creatures of the earth who are suffering and displaced by climate and ecological breakdown. We do so peacefully and lawfully, ready to engage and learn, because we care and we have hope. We read this statement at the start of every day, and between us gather up fresh ribbons. We walk, I hobble. The daily rhythm of walking, blisters endured, connects us with rivers, vales and dales, forests, wildlife, a diversity of insects, berries, birds. As my feet tread these miles with shared intent, I feel my heart break little by little, day by day. An exquisite connection with nature swim through my veins. My breathing slows, my muscles strengthen step by step, Fears, denials, angers unravel in my heart. Being slower than most, I assume responsibility for carrying the yellow flag at the back of the Camino, making sure no one is left behind. A strategic place for not getting lost and perfect for catching story threads as they drift downstream. At first, five miles feels more than enough. An eight becomes manageable. Ten miles, an easy day if the sun is with us. And finally, it takes 15 miles in thundering rain to be considered too much. Dressed in appropriate clothes, 
the body stops fighting the elements. The daily needs of a travelling community are met in simple ways. Two toilets, three wash basins, shared amongst 30. Porridge served by generous cooks, 5.30 a.m. Evening searches for a dusty cupboard, a comfy altar, quiet corner, a one square metre of floor space to claim as home for the night. Nighttime breathing. Covid tests. Washing lines, dripping wet clothes, peanut butter sandwiches devoured while aching muscles rest. Leaning on mossy lichen walls, overlooking swollen rivers. Smells of satsuma pith exploding in the rain. And of course, our daily dialogues with nature. Walking in silence. Remember... We are walking, remember, we are walking, remember, we are walking, we are walking on sacred ground. Walking, walking through rainbows, high winds, sleet, snow and glorious sunshine, we witness autumn fall as colours change to golds, reds, yellows. I become known as the humming lady because of the familiar sound of my Buddhist daimoku. Nam yo ring ikyo, nam yo ring ikyo, nam yo ring ikyo. My body tunes into what it was designed to do best, walking and listening. Village to town, hamlet to city, we meet extraordinary, and generous people. We learn to listen without judgment and with open hearts. We meet people who fear and despise us because we are the doom reapers. The season dips keenly towards winter equinox, shortening our walking days towards Halloween. Walking. I try to keep connection with home. I really do. But with every stepping out into new landscapes, I lose trace of the selves that connect me to home. Social media, usually thwarted with little to no reception, inexplicably tunes me in to my husband's cognitive assessment one wet Wednesday. A four-way surreal discussion between doctor, daughter, husband and myself. The call proceeds as my body trips through undergrowth in the depths of a forest in the borders of Scotland and my mind arrives punctual to a doctor's surgery in Nottingham. After which, my phone battery promptly dies. A strange, awkward letting go. A sloughing of responsibilities. Feet and boots weathering amiably a sloughing of rucksack detritus. We fairy folk emerge from the woods, prodigal children. We arrive in Glasgow exhausted, yes, but strong, determined, lighter. Circus Cop 26 did not, of course, bring the hope. Hope is visceral in the voices and stories of the thousands of people who made their own journeys to COP26. Peoples from all over the world. Meeting in the streets, in the people's summits, rooms in churches, cafes, libraries, theatres, stories, songs, rituals. Here is where the awakenings happened and the stories unleashed the way forward. Sustainable maps of regeneration interconnected value systems, placing care, passion and resilience for our beautiful planet at the fore. Generating hope to change the poison into medicine. And those inside, behind the government fences, could feel it. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs> Oh.
One night, I went into the bathroom and thought a giant python was going to enter my flat through the toilet basin. I jammed the lid shut, got my scales and put them on top. I wasn't sure if a python would be able to push the lid open. I shut the bathroom door firmly and went back to bed. In the morning, I found a python lying next to me, hissing. It was lying unfurled, poker straight, checking how big I was. One night, I went into the living room and my dead brother was standing there talking to me. I said to him, I wanted my mum to come to the UK and he said he thought it was a good idea. A crocodile was standing near the door, its mouth wide open. I placed one foot firmly on its head and clamped its mouth shut. One night, some tiny bear, some tiny baby bear cubs were lying in my bookshelf. I don't know why. One night, I was in a museum and a tiger jumped on my back, clawing at my flesh. The pain was searing hot. I fought and fought to get it off my back and ran. One night, I was running through a forest. I saw myself standing on the top of the floor of an abandoned house. My image flickered on and off like a faulty computer screen. Then I fell into swampy water but managed to drag myself out. I was soaking wet and stumbled and continued to run through the dark. One night, a mosquito bit me on my hand. The next day, my hand was blue. Look, someone said, you can see the pinprick hole where it bit you. I looked at my blue hand and yes, there was a tiny puncture where it had sucked my blood. I felt disgusted. One night, I decided not to go to sleep and lay in bed all night, hollow and dry-eyed, waiting, waiting for the dawn chorus. Then I would be safe and could fall asleep. No animals came into my home except in the darkness. The darkness, the enemy that robs me of sleep, that torments me with its silent, creeping emptiness. People's lives have changed in many ways, with people forced to work from home and others losing their usual work and taking on new challenges in those areas of work opened up, such as working for the NHS. Our final piece is by artist Lisa Alexander. Sound of gloves being taken off, like flashbacks on the staircase, Zed tracking a ghost shop. I cycle to the wetlands beyond, a canal towpath to infinity, feeling a person's arm, feeling a person's arm, imprint of soul through hand, anxious or not, their essential energy, there's something to it, the energetic. A muddy field of cows by an intersection, rhythms of rhythm, where no rhythm, lacks movement, a rut. Lid opens. The whack are up. Sign says offensive waste. Gloves go in the fuck, fuck, fuck pedal bin. The governments, the loneliness, the corporations, the parties, the laws passed in the midst of necessary restrictions. But more than this, right foot depresses pedal bin. A cock crows, keeps cycling. Holding it open once, twice, zero hours contract to the wetlands beyond. For swabs, syringe wrappings. The unpeeling of plasters, a tiny mountain of cotton wool, a cardboard tray, the hardest thing is to undo the tape, always the social inequalities. Kidney shapes we talk, causal connections. We are way past introductions now and past the point of comfortable silence, intensity of working in a pod of one other, and it's all on the table. 12 hours straight, like celebrants, we're into faithful with exhaustion of shock. The mind wanders across social qualities, its role in complex thought processes, a motif, a relief, an artwork, reaching across, then turning back, the swiveling stool, the swiveling stool, truth reveals itself in repetition. Am I too open? Is this proportionate? What is it to be human and other internal queries? How do we connect? Reaching across, turning back, 
Most shed layers of practical flourish. I steady a person through feeling the shoulder. Three fingers down, fleshy parts spread aside. Stand up, sit down, record. Introductions, singular answers, same questions. Overlap introductions to patient, field of work, expertise in life, for life, another life, others' lives. The repetitions reveal the exceptions that are the norm. Your arm connects to my arm, a kind of brief extension in which, which most languages are spoken and far away, the individual, double bound, buys in all services, alone in a small expensive space of impact inflation without touch. Here, it all intersects screen only social interaction. This borderland here, we cross between avoiding needle stick injuries in person with strangers, with friends. It's possible to be pierced by a difficult truth over and over like the burning bush not be consumed. We bring ourselves lives with us because when did it become offensive to share our pain and insights, to put down a heavy load amongst friends? When did it become acceptable to actively prohibit all kinds of exchanged, replaced, monetized, not to be confused of safety restrictions done through diversionary tactics? But we do it with and over, beside and under, in all ways, cannot control words movement of meaning, cannot restrain being left-handed. And so the encounter in person began with mist hanging over a cold sunrise on Victoria Park. When I couldn't stop cycling or I'd be late to this meeting and this meeting and this meeting. Everyone comes here. Take a seat as I wrangle a plastic apron from its roll, gel my hands, remove the vial and pack it, aseptic approach, gloved elbows, shots, drawer I spread, the apron out across my lap, I wait, perhaps a preamble, a nurse's final checks, consent, began with cycling. I check again, I admit. I time it by the progress of the father and grown son, crossing the road from the park with their dog and to where the free women walking arm in arm in tracksuits and hijabs have got to just before the sun rises. I consent in the section from the People's Park Tavern to the A12 before I reach the overpriced, poorly constructed housing development, London Fields, Victoria Park. Olympic Park. Sweet spot of the deltoid muscle. Last Friday, the 14th of January, as I write, the gate at the edge was locked shut. A man helped me lift my bicycle over. Another caught me, rucksack, water bottle and all, as I straddled the wrought iron spikes, heavier than we both thought on the other side of the gate. First embrace for months. From here I cycle over the A12, over the River Lee navigation, and over the River Lee itself, each spelt differently on the map. Never thought I'd be here still, but flexibility is a wisdom for living well. Stopping time with movement, thinking some of the same thoughts down the same streets. Many of us live on the margins of society. The world is contiguous. Everyone comes here. Everyone works here, the recently arrived, someone I used to know, a variety of news channels, the whole family, the person alone af after work and out of work at the end and at the beginning of life. End of the beginning that was the beginning of a series of endings that we always knew would come. Did we always know? We knew, we knew. It's okay in this moment. Let the chair take the weight of your back. Your shoulders drop, your arms hang down. So much is understood proprioceptively. Breathe, be still. A coming to terms of grief in all its varieties. Overlaps, repeated cycle rides. No sense unseen, not understood. Resting heart rate flips between heart is breaking come full circle to the wetlands beyond. A desire to learn, to understand, imprint of soul through hand.
Thank you. Thank you. There's now a five minute break and we will reconvene shortly for questions and answers. I just have five minutes. Long, fifty-seven. Long, flowers around you. Long, flowers. to allow the audience to put their cameras on.
So welcome back everyone. And I'll now introduce you to Susan Croft and Shola. And you can, and they'll answer your questions. Shola, we are. <laughs> if anyone's got any questions. Um, we could go to gallery view probably best at this point. So uh, people are invited to bring their uh, cameras back on. Is that doable at this point? We I think they need to, you need to, uh, to ask them to do it because they I think they've not been given yeah. them oh hang on no it's worked it's worked well Catherine Kathleen's able to but uh, Catherine Kate Price was having difficulty um wow I'm asking people so to can start video well, yeah. and uh <laughs> I'm doing it individually. I'm sure, I don't know if you can do it. I'm sure you can do it collectively or ask people to start video. But uh, anyway. It's a matter of choice, though, I think. It is a matter of choice. I mean, but uh, I'm, I'm, you can, I'll put it on and then if people want to turn it off again, then they are. Please do so. But um, I'm not sure. Well, Dominique, are we able to put every, allow everybody? as a group thing too. Yeah, yeah, I allowed everybody, so everybody Okay, so sorry, okay, if you don't want to be able to put yourself yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, sorry, I'm just... <laughs> right. We've got the camera. So you should be able to all turn on your cameras if you want. Is Tanya there? Yeah, uh, Tanya, when you put your hand up, you've got masks on. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, she's got a friend with her, that's why. Yeah, so Tanya's and in terms. And hi, hi, Yuki, Eureka, Tanya, hi. Susan, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the blog and how the evening came to be? Yeah, well, I don't know how many people, some people here will have um, been at the last year's events. Um, we did an event in March um, 2021 which was called Her Inside Women in the Lockdown, which was three plays and we had a song by Helen Chadwick and um, a number of poems, um, all of which were on the blog, which came out of this blog that I'd set up originally in April 2020. And that came out of two things. One was the play reading group that I'd organized on Zoom um, quite early on. Um, and most of the performers tonight have been part of that over the past two years. Yeah, it's nearly two years since we started the play reading group, meeting initially on a, on a weekly basis and then on a fortnightly basis. And we were reading a combination of basically it was stuff that I had in digital form so I could send it out to people. And um, so because of my kind of two passions and areas of focus, that was a mixture of new women playwrights and alternative theatre scripts sort of from the 70s and 80s that we were kind of re-exploring and then um, what was strange was that the particularly the new women plays were lots of which were like the ones tonight about women trying to kind of step out from restricted social roles were suddenly incredibly resonant with what we were going through as women in lockdown in confinement in social isolation and so that first piece kind of drew on those pieces and also and also a piece called Breathless, which was an April de Angelis play from 1986, um, that all had a strong resonance with the idea of being in lockdown. And then, um, then we so that was the event last year. It would draw on that whole, all those pieces, plus new work that people had started submitting to the blog that I'd, I'd set up with the help of um, Izzy Shaw, who did the, um, the design, um, as a space for people to share their reflections on um, the experiences of lockdown um, and confinement. And then um, in the summer in July, when everything sort of started to reopen, we did, um, actually we contributed to I think three performances um, one which was all her inside and then some others as part of a festival that was done locally called Love and Survival in Time of Covid. And then 
I'd got a bit of funding for that from the local connections fund. I'd got a bit of funding for the thing in March, in fact. And then they sent out a thing saying, oh, do you want to apply for a second tranche of funding? So I wrote in August, I wrote this application saying, yes, we'll do a performance or a, and a whole new development of the blog, which is about her inside stepping outside optimistically. And so I put that in in, in August. And then as Judy read in the script, came um, it came closer. We were looking to do the performance in November and so many people were ill with COVID at that point or were you know, impacted by it, looking after other people who were ill or just exhausted or whatever. We had to delay it and that ended up being this performance. But, you know, so stepping outside, going back inside, because there's a new variant, stepping outside again, to going back inside again. And so that's kind of where we got to um, eventually. So tonight was um, putting together some of those responses to this new prompt you know would people like to write about the idea of stepping outside and and the desire for it and the fear of it and also then I asked Tanya to write about because I knew she'd done this amazing walk like others to COP26 and I knew Lisa had been working for the NHS and that had been kind of stepping outside her normal role and uh, stepping outside there was stepping outside comfort zone stepping into activism all the various themes that we touched upon so that's kind of where it, it came from, trying to put together some of that work and wanting to share it with a larger audience. Can we, um, uh, we'd like, it'd be good to talk to all the actors in terms of their contribution, but can we start with Tanya and with Lisa, who um, have these journeys? Could they just give us a little bit more insight into the creation? Let's start with Lisa first, the creation of their pieces. Um, well, yeah, no, Susan approached me. I mean, I've been wanting, can you hear me? Um, yeah, I've been wanting to um, to contribute something to the blog for a while and then other events just took over and then and then she sort of asked me to, to, to consider thinking about something. And um, I just started writing bits and pieces literally as I was cycling really early in the morning. Um, and um, and all the things that have been swirling around in my head really for the last couple of years and all the things that I'd gone through and a lot of us have gone through lots of different things and you know all my work had stopped and I had a period of caring and then um, but this sort of continued uh, the cycling was a continued sort of meditation and, it, and 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 I spent a lot of time in um, just parts quite near um, en route to these where I worked um, in Westfield and uh, it sort of all came together like that sort of overlapping um, really um, and it was very much a, a sort of a visceral thing but it felt very sort of uh, I don't know it felt very political and then also to be re-socialized with many many different people which was wonderful after a lot of isolation yeah. And Tanya, yours was a very personal piece as well as a political piece. So it's, uh, you know, both about the environment uh, on the global sense, but also the environment on a personal uh, sense. Would you like to just say a little bit more about that, please? Mm. Gosh, I think I'm still very, very bunged up and feeling very... Um, responsible my dear friend that's sitting next to me <laughs> terrified that I'm giving her my um my my covid germs um yeah I, I, in a funny way it just goes on doesn't it mm. I really enjoyed this evening can I just say that I just felt I was so moved you know poem the plays everything it was, it was really beautiful and beautifully read by people it's a lovely warm evening thank you um how did it come susan bullied me into doing the writings i have to be really honest and thank you susan um because i'm one of those women who never make time really i i did come back with the intention of wanting to write and of course i'm a full-time carer so that that takes priority um, and then also we went straight into Extinction Rebellion actions when I got home. So there's always, I, I guess, that moment where we decide 
activism is the raison d'etre. <laughs> it means that there's a deep point, I think, where something shifts in one side and also being of a certain age. I'm now of an age where I'm going maybe 10 years, maybe 15, maybe 20 max, you know, but it's like everything now is dedicated. We've got 10 years to make a profound shift and, um, and I've just decided to dedicate that. But passionately, I'm a theatre maker. So I think at the moment it's about weaving, you know, all the things that have happened during this COVID time, this stepping out, the connectivity that we're all feeling, Black Lives Matter, the climate change, you know, none of these things, what's happening in Ukraine, the energy injustice, you know, all of it's adding up. And in that, there's a vitality, I think, about waking up in the morning and going, why am I here? You know, what's this about? But the walking, just to finish, the actual walking 